All right. So let's go over today's lecture. So um, just to kind of situate ourselves in this uh, in the syllabus. Last time we just went over the mechanics of the course, and today I want to give uh, um, give everybody an overview of the file system. Um, as I talked about last time, this is one of the main things that I want everyone to be comfortable with when you leave this class, not be wondering where your file is or where, where it gets downloaded or how to find things on the command line. Um, but it takes knowing the uh, kind of theory, the idea behind the hierarchical file system was not derived from nature, it was made by people. They designed it. So if you've read the, most of you have read the Unix time sharing system paper, this is the original kind of public publication on the Unix system which described their hierarchical uh, file system. I don't, they didn't invent all aspects of it, but they, um, they invented a design that is really still in use today by, by uh, most co uh, computer systems that, that you'll use. So all right, so let me go over, the, go over this file system. So many of you may, may look at this and think, well, this is the file system. When I think of the file system, I think of this graphical interface that allows me to click on files, open things, run things. Um, but this is not really the file system. This is the uh, file browser or file explorer. This is an application that interfaces with the file system to let you do operations on files, like moving things, copying things, browsing things. Um, so this is really just a view of the file system. Um, but there's much more under the hood that files do uh, in the operating system. And so the, the main thing to take away here is that um, files are not some physical thing that lives on disk. They're an abstraction. They're a way to group sequences of binary data. Um, that's basically all files are. There's no naming. There's no hardware specific. There's no file formats. Um, and the purpose of the file abstraction, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the purpose of it, but the reason is, is that there's lots of different ways to store data on hardware. And there's also lots of ways to do I.O. for a machine. And in the Unix philosophy, the file abstraction is the way to capture all of these uh, different types of hardware and different types of I.O. in a single abstraction. Uh, so why is it an abstraction? It's an abstraction because, just like any abstraction, it captures what's common about something. In this case, it captures what's common about I.O. And we're going to talk mostly about storage files in this class. Um, so what files do is they capture what's common about storage hardware. So what are some different data storage technologies that you can think of? Floppy disk. Floppy disk. Okay, that's an old one. Others? Yeah. SSD. SSD. Yeah. Hard drives, which are, which are different. Um, and they all have different physical properties to them. They have all different ways to actually store data. And depending, yeah, go ahead. The what? Sure, you can think of the cloud as a storage mechanism. If you have some interface to access data to it, you could you could use files as an abstraction for that. Yeah. USB stick. USB stick. Yeah. So it has a different um, uh, bus interface than like a hard drive. Yeah. A charger. Yeah. So the charger, unless it's like a malicious charger that can do more than just deliver power, then it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be except doing I/O. You would hope. Yeah. Magnetic tape, yeah, sure. So all of these are different physical media. Um, and depending on the bus that they're connected to, they have, there's different instructions that you have to send to them in order to read and write data. <clears throat> well, what the file does is it abstracts away all the differences between this different hardware. And it gives you a very, very simple interface. It, al it allows you to use all of these different storage media with the same commands, with the same functions that I'm sure you're all familiar with. So you can read sequences of data, sequences of bytes, and you can write sequences of bytes. Now, of course, it's a little more complicated than this. You can open files, you can close files, there's, there's permissions and all this. But at the, at the end of the day, the file abstraction, it just takes any piece of hardware or any, any piece of software and turns it into something that you can read and write sequences of bytes from. Uh, so in this class, we're going to be using the Unix-style <coughs> file abstraction. This is used pretty much everywhere. Even Windows, I think, supports the, uh, the POSIX compliance, you know, the Unix standards. Okay. <coughs> so 
So to illustrate uh, this, this distinction between the file and the stuff around it, like its name, where it's stored, see the abstract part of it, let's take a look at uh, the contents of a file. This is the terminal here on, on the right. <clears throat> so we'll start next week. We'll go over actual like terminal commands, but I just want to illustrate for you um, what's inside of these files. So this is, so let me actually show you what this is. So this is just a simple hello world program if you were to open this up in your editor. And so from the OS point of view, the contents of this file is a sequence of bytes. And this is a sequence of bytes in hex code and hexadecimal. And with this dash C flag, I can ask it to convert those hex bytes into ASCII. So if you were to you know, read this disk raw, not mediated through a file system, and you were to examine what bits were set, you would see, at least written in hexadecimal here, these sequences of bits <coughs> are set for the file that is, uh, corresponds to hello.c. And so notice that there's no notion of text here. Uh, we have to interpret these sequences of bytes as text, and that's what the ASCII convention does. The ASCII convention just assigns numbers to uh, Latin and other characters. Yeah? What does the C flag do? The C flag uh, adds this ASCII interpretation of the, of the bytes to your right. Oh, okay. How yeah, the what's that? Are How come the what? Oh, 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 that's a very good question. Um, so I think this is because of endianness. So you see these are, these, every, uh, every byte is swapped here. Yeah. So two, three, six, nine, six, four. So I think it must also be reinterpreting the endianness, endianness. So uh, this is probably showing the whole 16 bit, I guess, word. And this is not, this is showing the 8 bit ones. Let me, let me look at the, uh, So it actually doesn't say in here, but I think that's what's going on. Are these any errors? Like, up, up above? No, 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 no. Like, like, um, oh, yeah. These kind of, oh, yeah, those are the errors. Yeah, those like the, I thought there were errors for a second. No, this is just a manual page. Um, so, yeah, this is just because of the endianness. So I guess in this canonical format, I don't know, I don't know which one is which. I guess this is... Uh, interpreting the endianness, and this is this is not this is just however it's stored. So on disk. I think that's what's going on. Okay, so is that the X the alpha we're supposed to have with many our hello dot uh, Don't worry about that yet. The, 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 we'll assign that in several weeks. This is this is just to show you uh, files in the file system. Okay, so that's the contents of a file. In this case, the hello world dot c file. Even though your editor reads it as or interprets it for you as ASCII characters as, as Latin characters. Um, on disk, it's just a sequence of bytes. So this has a .c extension. So what does that, what does that mean? Um, and it turns out that files don't capture the extension at all. They don't even capture the name. And at least in the Unix design of file systems, the data within the file uh, has nothing to do with the, the name. The name is not captured in the, in the file. So let me show an example of, of what, this, what this looks like. So there's a useful command in the Unix world called file, and it'll tell you the type of file that it is. So here it's telling us that this is C source code and it's ASCII text. If I take, say, an MP3 file, which is a music file, it'll tell me, oh, okay, this is an audio file containing MPEG, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But notice if I say rename hello to hello.mp3, uh, what is this file? What do you think this file command is going to tell us? What, what kind of file is it going to tell us this is? C source? C -source? Who says C source? Who says mp3? Who doesn't know? <laughs> okay. So it still tells us it's C source, still tells us ASCII text. Why? Why? Because it's looking at the contents of the file. 
and not the actual name. It's not looking at the name of the file. So this is an example of the map is not the territory problem. So the name is just referencing the file. The file itself is just sequences of bytes. Yeah. Well, so I changed it here, and I didn't get a warning. So you must be talking about a very specific interface that's giving a warning. Windows. So Windows, if you use the File Explorer, this application, so the programmers added a feature to avoid, I guess, a mismatch between the file contents and the extension. Um, I'll actually show some examples where malware uses uh, this distinction between the name versus the actual contents to, to like deceive people. Uh, so applications will indeed some have some file explorer applications like Mac does this as well. Will warn you or even try to prevent you from changing the extension. Um, but it's really to avoid this uh, mismatch between the name and the actual file. So I, I copied it to an MP3 file. I could move it as well, um, and I'm not going to get any complaints from my move command <laughs> doing this. But yes, applications. The applications developers do that to avoid headaches on on your end. Stands for copy, C P C O P Y, um, and we'll go over that. We'll go over that next week. Um, so yeah. So similarly, I can do this with the uh, MP3 file, and as I, I hope now you can you can guess that even if I rename it to .c, this file command still knows that it's actually an MP3 file. So let's see why that is. For in this case. So if I look at the cons oops, that's the whole contents of the MP3 file. That's a lot. So just look at the, the top of it. You'll see at the very beginning, there's a sequence of bytes, ID3. Um, and so let me, uh, let me move on here and show, uh, show why this happened. So there, there's lots of types of files that are, you know, regardless of what the extension is, what the file name is, there are several types of files based on how they're used. So text files are strings of characters. ASCII characters. And so you can figure out whether something is an ASCII file or not by whether it has ASCII numbers or not. If you have numbers that are outside the range of ASCII, then um, it's probably not an ASCII file. Program files are sequence of machine code. Uh, images, music, like my MP3 file here, well, there's these custom binary file formats for different kinds of audio encodings. And so what this file command does is there is a, uh, it basically just has a database of, it has a database of these magic bytes. So when non-malicious users of files operate, they uh, insert these magic bytes at the head of the file, at the very beginning of the file, to help applications identify what kind of file it is. Uh, and so this ID3 prefix is uh, the magic bytes for audio files that have these, these tags in them. The, the type of file is not so important. The, the important part here is uh, this notion of magic bytes. Um, and so that's what we see, that's what we saw at the head of this uh, MP3 file. So anyway, this is, this is all to, to say that the contents of the file are uh, not at all related to what the name is. The contents of the file does not know what the name is, and the name does not know the contents of the file, does not reflect the contents of the file, because I can just change the extension and lie to you. And this actually has, yeah, go ahead. Where is the name Ah, that's a really good question. We'll, we'll see that in a couple of slides, where the name is actually stored. And it's, it's quite clever uh, how it works. So just to kind of give a little, a little quick security preview, this has like real world security co consequences. So for instance, one of the earliest, largest computer worms, the I love you computer worm, um, exploited this distinction between the name and what it actually represents. And what they did is they took this VB script program, with a virtual basic script, which is a program <clears throat> that in Windows at the time would just automatically run when you double click on it. And they named it .txt.vbs. And I think by default the extension is hidden. So you should probably be suspicious that there's a .txt extension when they're hidden. But uh, this fooled many, many people. I'm sure it would have fooled me. I don't think I was fooled by this, hopefully. But I don't think I ever received it. But um, you can see that the... Uh, the trick here was the file extension was hidden. So users thought that this was a TXT file, thought it was totally fine to see who the secret admirer was and double click on it. Uh, but then this VB script program ran and spread itself and emailed lots and lots of other people. 
So that was one fun example of, of messing with people's impressions of, of file extensions and how they don't necessarily match up what they are. There are also cases where uh, malware will hide files. They'll call them something innocuous like .txt, but during the course of their installation, they'll rename them so that they can be you know, executed. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of uh, examples of this if you're really interested in like security and, and this masquerading file type uh, issue, which derives from the distinction between the name and the actual contents. Uh, take a look at these uh, links. Yeah. Uh, so it wasn't actually hidden. It was hidden because, uh, if I remember correctly, it was hidden because the operating system would hide file extensions by default. Uh, and so what the user saw was a name with the extension, but you know you, you can be forgiven for for mistaking that if you're you know forgetting that the file the file system's hiding it. Um, yeah. So the extension wasn't actually hidden in this case, or it wasn't actually it was actually there on the file uh, in the um, uh, in the email attachment. But I was think it was just hidden by default. Yeah. Could a VPS be like be affecting your computer because of like a virus? Well, it's a program, so viruses are nothing more than programs that you don't want to run on your on your program. I mean, there's there's no distinction between a virus and a legitimate program, and there are some legitimate programs that act like viruses. Uh, it's really just about um, you need like a model of what you want to run on your machine. So viruses are things that usually other people are running on your machine that you probably don't want to run, if that makes sense. So viruses are really just programs. They're just applications that run, and they're developed like applications these, these days. OK, so the very good prescient question from your, your colleague, how do files get their names? If the file name has nothing to do with the actual contents, well, how do they get their names? OK, so they get their names through directories. So if you read the uh, Unix time sharing system, you'll talk about their kind of directory, their hierarchical file system and the directory structure. So directories are really just things that map names to files, the actual file. So you can think of this like pointers in C, where the name is the pointer, and the file is the actual thing being pointed to. Or like phone numbers, where if you have a phone book, it's mapping people's names to their um, landline. Do people still use landlines? To their landline. And similarly, there may be many people pointing to the same landline. Uh, and there may be changes of those names, but the, the um, landline number stays the same. And so the way this works under the hood, and we're not going to go into how this is implemented, but the operating system assigns a unique number to every file, every sequence of bytes that's stored on disk, for instance, to every file. Um, okay, so why do this? Why separate the name from the file? Why might, why might this be useful? It obviously has problems, yeah. Sure, yeah, you could, you could avoid, you could, instead of a tree, you could have a little directed graph and you could store the same, give the, the same file many names. Um, another example, I just, I just put it up, but you can rename really easily. You don't, you don't have to you actually have to touch the file to rename it, to rename anything. Um, so the other kind of clever part of this is that the directories, these mappings between file names and the actual file inode number, those themselves are also files. This gets very kind of meta and mind warping here, where the directory is just another kind of file. And so if you read that, uh, read the paper, they have this philosophy that files are more than just storage. They're an abstraction or a model of I.O., of all kinds of I.O. in the system. Yeah? Is it kind of like nodes of a pointing to each other in the way? Um, the I, uh, so the way the file system is implemented is implemented like a linked list. But the I node, you can think of it as the head of the list. Um, but the directories themselves are not like, well, I mean, they're a tree or a graph, so in that sense, they're like, they're like links. Um, the directory does provide links. So as a, you know, to, to foreshadow a little bit, directories can contain other directories because they're just files. They're just maps to files. Um, but so directories are just files. They're just fi special files that store mappings between names and these inode numbers. And so it's directories that give names to files. To the operating system, the file is just some unique number with a sequence of bytes. Yeah? So like when you copy paste files from say your desktop to your documents, you're not actually moving the location of the data, you're just like moving where the pointer is. Ah, okay, so if you move, yes. If you copy, you are telling the operating system to make a fresh version of that file. Okay. 
So abstractly, you could edit the copy and it wouldn't change the original. Now, under the hood, the operating system will use caching in order to avoid having to, I think, they may wait to do that writing the disk. But at the end of the day, if you do a copy, the semantics of copy is I want a fresh, distinct copy of those bytes in a new file. Um, move, but move, uh, yeah, as, as I think I pointed out, move requires basically no, uh, it requires no copying. Only the directory gets edited in a move. All right, question, question so far? Yeah. So the like, file structure is uh, and the directory, directory structure is completely separate from the actual location of where the file is stored in like, any physical media, right? Where like, moving the file in an abstract way will never like, necessarily cause the improvement of the location of the data. Yeah, that's exactly right. So you can freely rename and move files. But on disk, they may never actually move anywhere. They may stay in the same place. And that's actually true of deleting files as well. I didn't put this in here. But if you so-called delete a file, a, uh, say, forensic ana analyst could just still search the bytes that are written on your disk and recover those files or undelete files. <clears throat> so that's another reason why, um, why what one consequence of this scheme is that if I delete a file, all that really happens when you remove a file is you just remove this entry. And so the operating system may no longer be aware of this file. Uh, the data for it is still on disk. Uh, yeah? So this is more of a question for an OS class, but the, the operating system maintains a list of all data that's used and not used. Just like in memory, if you learned about malloc, uh, that might be an operating system too. But the operating system ma manages where on disk, the file system manages where on disk uh, blocks are free and blocks are not free. So they get, they basically, they'll get overwritten over time is what will happen. So immediately it'll still be there, but then they'll be overwritten over time. Yeah. Um, so what happens when you link, like, certain directories to other directories? So that, this is getting more sort of advanced file system. There are two types of links, hard links. Hard links are just uh, uh, using the same inode number in different directories. Soft links is a new file that contains the path to the... Oh to the other file. So don't worry about that too much. Hard links, you can look this up with the ln command. I can talk about this maybe uh, next week. Um, but yeah, there are two kinds of links in the Unix world. Other questions? Other questions on this? Yeah. Could there be some way to maybe take a deleted file, like some, some kind of leftover reference and kind of reconstruct it? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so this is what like digital forensics people do. They'll, they have tools to just search through the kind of raw bytes of the hard drive and look and basically reconstruct the file. If it's recently deleted, the file in its entirety will be there because the deletion does not happen uh, on, the, on the file itself. It happens in the directory. So this entry will just be removed, but all of the data for that file will still be on disk. You just won't know the name necessarily, but yeah, it'll, it'll still be there. So yes, you can absolutely recover deleted files from a disk as long as more you know, file operations haven't happened. So you know, SSDs have this problem where uh, if you write to the same byte, uh, under the hood, they're actually not writing to the same physical location. It's called wear leveling because SSDs have this like limited lifespan. Um, and so the, uh, the, the firmware will actually write to different locations so that the same locations don't get used a lot so they don't wear out as evenly. Um, so SSDs are notoriously hard to delete, really delete by files in. Um, I think one thing you could do is just like fill up the entire hard drive maybe. I, I wouldn't recommend trying to do that. I think what the government does is they just destroy the physical medium. If you really want to destroy the data, you have to like physically destroy. Uh, there's some great videos on how to destroy physical media from like DEF CON and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, you, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. On uh, storage media, in, in every case, is, is all the um, all, all the stuff like uh, like uh, like the yeah, FIY and, and stuff. Is that all taken care of? Like at the, at the hardware level, like the way it interfaces with any machine is always like uh, uh, completely abstracted out. Just like I think so. So I'm I'm no expert on the hardware level, but from what I understand, there is a chip inside of all these storage devices, a firmware chip. Mm -hmm that they, there's a common interface on the bus that you say to read and write to. And then it can basically do whatever it wants to write uh, to disk. So I think in the old days, um, the, the um, protocol matched like the physical uh, contents of a disk. 
But I, I think firmware these days does more sophisticated stuff. For instance, if part of the disk is dead, can't be written, they'll like gloss over that somehow. Um, but this is really outside of my expertise. But from my understanding, it is the firmware is doing uh, extra work besides just literally writing to a specific location for you. All right, so this is the magic of directories. So directories are just files that hold names and the actual inode number, the, the telephone number, to the sequence of bytes on disk. So this is why you have these masquerading file type problems. This is why you can move files very, very quickly because you don't actually have to move the file. You just change its name in the directory. And so this, we already kind of talked about this. Um, so moving a file and renaming a file, they're the same thing. There's only a single command in Unix for moving a file, and it's the same as renaming. Because all they, all both of them, all either of them do is just edit this directory file to change the name of the file. That's all it does. Yeah? Can you refresh a node number? Uh, refresh a node number? Like, like, sorry, like oh, reuse one? No, like an inode number is just the operating system provides it. Whenever you make a new file, the operating system provides a new unique ID. Think of it like a telephone number. You know, you go to the telephone number company. The, the operating system manages this. To the file, not to the directory. To the file, yeah, to the file. So, the, so in, in your mind, think of the file as just a sequence of bytes on disk. The operating system has a unique ID to refer to each one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So if I rename this to Bob, then the I, it'll just change this name and the inode number will stay the same. Yeah, good, good, good clarification. Yeah. Uh, so to make that clear, let me go into how the hierarchical directory structure works. So, yeah, renaming, it's obvious here, right, because you just changed the directory. So let me make that clear by asking this question. Can directories contain other directories? Yeah, yeah. yeah because directories are just files. So there's nothing stopping you from having this inode number reference a directory file instead of a uh, regular file, a file that contains data, like uh, ASCII text. And so to answer your question about how you move a file, well, you just add uh, the end, take, like say we're removing hello to a different directory, we would just remove it from this directory's entry and just add it to a different directory file's entry. And now it'll, yeah. The number will be the same. So all moves and renames do nothing to the uh, inode file. Actually, let me, I can, um, I can prove this to you. So uh, ls-i will, will show you, oops, will show you uh, inode numbers. And so I could move, hopefully this works, I haven't tried this. So let's just move it to new file. And let's see if it keeps the same inode number. So. It originally had 4421401, and yeah, same inode number. I could even make a subdirectory, move that new file into the subdirectory, and look at the inode number, and it's still the same. Yeah. Oh, so somebody, somebody's saying they, they forced shut down their machine without uh, shutting it down safely. Uh, that's just because the operating system keeps stuff in memory in RAM, part of their files in RAM. So your, your file system probably had not synced back to physical disk yet. That just, they use RAM to make file operations faster. Uh, yeah. Does changing the file type affect the file at all? So the, it depends on what you mean by file type. Do you mean the extension or the... Extension has no bearing at all on the inode number, so I could, you know, rename uh, this new file to a PDF, and its inode number stays the same. The file uh, command still knows that it's this was a compiled, uh, this was an, uh, an object file that I compiled, so it still uh, knows it's a um, an ELF file which is the, the um, machine code format uh, used on, on Linux. Because the inode didn't change, the data didn't change on disk at all, just the directory mapping of names to inode numbers changed. That's it. All right. 
Good on this concept? Other questions on this? So once you can wrap your head around this, it makes it a little easier to uh, think about the, the hierarchical file system, I think. Okay, so when directories contain other directories, this is where the hierarchical file system emerges. There were early operating systems, I think early versions of DOS, had no hierarchy. They just you could have like one level of directories, and that's it. Um, so, all right, so let's uh, let's actually get into some. I want to illustrate for you graphically this hierarchical file system and some of the conventions that uh, Unix-style systems use. <coughs> so the root of every so every file system on a Unix system has a single root directory, and it's called root, and it's denoted with a forward slash. So if you've ever seen forward slash at the beginning of a path. This is where it comes from. It's the top level of the file system. So I think everyone's learned about trees. And so you can think of this as the root of a tree or the root of a directed graph. And um, when we have nested directories, because we can have directories within directories, we separate their names with a forward slash as well. Uh, and I'll, I'll get into these next two, how they, how they work. But all directories also contain a directory called dot that refers to itself. And so you might wonder why would you need a directory that refers to itself, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. It also contains a special directory called dot dot, which refers to its parent directory. So I'll, let me go through some examples to explain uh, how this works and why. Yeah? Oh, that's a good question. The root, the root directory's parent is itself. So it points to itself. That's, that's how they resolve that uh, infinite regress problem. OK, so let me actually get a, let me get, let me get the uh, whiteboard up, or digital board. Is this the kind of thing that you want to Yeah, you'll draw a tree. You'll draw a tree. OK, so let me write out a example directory structure here. All right, so I'm going to make, whoops. I'm going to put directories in green here. Is that, uh, is this visible? Not really. All right. Let me make this thicker. How's that? Can you see that? Okay. So that's our root directory. I'll put directories in green here. I'll put files in blue. So here's a text file. And I'll also, by convention, put a forward slash after the name of directories to make it also doubly clear that they are, they are directories. Okay, so let me draw out this example directory path here. So it's called Paul. Let's make another file under here. File.c. I've also got another directory under my directory called home as well. Okay, so here's my file system. At the root, I've got a directory, a directory called root, and inside of the root directory, there are two files. One is hello.txt, which is a regular file, uh, and one is another directory file called home. Under that home directory, there is one file called Paul. That file is a special directory file, and it contains two files, file.c and another directory. This directory is also called home. And so even though uh, both these files are named home, because they're in different directories, that's allowed. There's no name clash here. We can uniquely uh, identify these files. That home directory contains one file. It's a special file, the directory file, called Joe. 
And that also contains a file called file.c. So quick quiz, this file.c and this file.c, are they the same file? Probably not. They technically could be with hard links, but let's forget about links in this, in this case. Because they're in a different directory, right, right. So excluding links between files, which are kind of an advanced thing, assuming there's no links, they're in different directories, so you can't assume that they're the same file. Okay, yeah. Yeah, the inode is what distinguishes a unique file. Yeah, so even, yeah, go ahead. Hard links, they'd be the same file. It's actually the same inode. So uh, that's what a hard link does, is it, it gives different names or different paths to the same inode. Uh, we can talk about that next week if you really want to see it, but it's, it's, it makes things confusing. They're not used that much, except, yeah. yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly right. So like if you look at like a file browser, um, yeah, this would be one of the folder icons. You, you open it up and you see these other ones. Or if you, you show it as a tree, then you'll see a tree that you know, looks, looks like this. If you see a tree. Okay, so let's go over paths. Paths are a really important convention to learn about. Um, they'll help, they basically help you uniquely point to one file on this tree. So let's talk about absolute paths first. So an absolute path is a description of all the directories that you need to get through in order to find the file that you're referring to. So let's say I want to refer to this file.c. What does my absolute path look like? Well, starting from the root, I put the root directory name, which is always forward slash, and home is the directory that files parent is contained in. So this is the home directory that I have to go through, the Paul directory, and then finally file.c. So this little convention here is a way to uniquely identify every at least name of a file. So excluding hard links, let's forget about hard links for a second. This is how we can uniquely identify every file named in our file system hierarchy. And if you are familiar with URLs, web URLs, uh, comes from the same concept, a unique identifier for some resource, some data. Uh, in this case, it's on a file system and actually probably predates uh, URLs and probably influenced them. Uh, but this is how, this is an absolute path because we start from the root and we list every directory that we need to enter in order to find the file that we're trying to refer to. Questions on that? Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Can you replace the file that's you with the, the I number? Um, so paths by convention are the names, not the inode numbers. So if you had the inode number, you wouldn't need the path. You'd already have a way to refer to the, uh, the contents of the file. <clears throat> so the paths are, are purely an artifact of this hierarchical file system where directories are mapping names to inode numbers. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so what would be the absolute path to this file.c? Say again? Okay, so root, and then what's the next directory? Home. So we're trying to go to this file. And what's the next directory, anyone? Paul. And we separate directories with a slash, and then, yeah, home. Good, Joe. Good. Yeah, so you, you can think of an absolute path as just a way to start from the root, because there's only one root in the entire file system, and it tells you each directory that you need to enter so that you can find the named file in your file tree. <coughs> Questions? Questions on that? Oh, 
Ah, that's because you're on a Windows file system. <coughs> the Windows file system does not historically have a unique root. It has multiple roots. And that was from the DOS days where each root was like a different hardware device. That's the root of one of the storage devices, yeah. yeah. The Linux world may uh, have the file system unified into a single tree, but if you have other devices as described in the, in the uh, paper, those other uh, file systems will be mapped to some directory in this tree. Um, I won't worry about this too much, but you, but you can basically mount an external disk to be Paul, for instance, and then it'll be kind of absorbed into this one giant file tree. <coughs> this is more for a IT or OS class, but yeah, so Windows, it does not apply. They have a tree of uh, file systems. But yeah, so you can think of C colon as the, they also use backslash uh, as, their, as their path separator. At least historically. Okay, questions about absolute paths? Pretty straightforward, right? It's just a little language or a little sort of way to uh, describe a node on a tree. So you, I think you all learned about trees in CS1, CS2. So uh, a URL or a path is just a um, basically one path or one trace of a of a, of a uh, path from a root to some leaf node on the tree. Okay, so let's talk about relative paths because this is a much, much more confusing part of the Unix world. Okay, so in order to understand what a relative path is, we have to understand a couple of concepts. So one, there's this notion of a working directory. And this is a design idea in the Unix world that whenever a program is running, it's running given a initial uh, directory that it runs in. So I'm going to use this orange bubble to denote the working directory. Uh, so for instance, when I was in my um, command line prompt here, this teaching, COP, etc., this is the working directory of my shell program. So any uh, any operations I do will be with respect to that working directory. Yeah? So it's all of them or just the one for instance? Say again? All of them? All the directories there or just the one for instance? Well, so this is a path. So this is this is the absolute path that I'm currently in. So you know about absolute paths, right? Uh, so there's only one directory that's a working. You only have you only have one directory that you're working in, and so this is the working directory that I'm that I'm currently in. And so this is this is totally just a, this is a design notion. This is a made up notion that the the operating system maintains with the running application. So if I am a running application, like like so, for instance, if you ever opened up like Firefox, your browser, you went to save a file and it just opened up in a specific directory. Maybe it remembered it. You can think of that as like the working directory. You know, rather than always starting at the root, the uh, application maintains a current working directory, it's called. So I'm gonna denote the current working directory with an orange uh, dot here. And so a relative path is a path that starts from the working directory. So if, I'm, if this is my current working directory, now how can I refer to file.c? Well, I can omit the, okay, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Right, so by convention, if you omit the first forward slash, the first forward slash because the only the root file system is named forward slash, then if you omit that forward slash, then the system assumes that you're referring to a file from the current working directory. Our current working directory here is slash home slash. So I'll, I'll put here that our current working directory is slash home slash here. 
So if I then want to reference file.c, if my current working directory is slash home slash. So one idea was to do slash Paul. The problem here is by, by we won't know, be able to know the difference between an absolute path and a relative path. So by convention, any paths that start with, let me use a different color here. A slash. Yeah, any paths that start with a slash uh, means absolute. Because that's the root. And I mean, this is all by design. Some, you know, people invented this design, but this is the convention that we use in the Unix world. But if you start with a forward slash, you're talking only about an absolute path. If it's not a forward slash, it's always relative and relative to the working, current working directory. So if my current working directory is slash home, in order to refer to this file.c, I can just say paul slash File dot C. Is that like shorter or quicker than like the the, 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 the other one, like the absolute path? Um, I mean, it's a shorter path. Do you mean if you're writing on the command line? Yeah, it can be shorter on the command line. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like if you're working with files all within within your working directory, it's like factoring out the common denominator. Yeah, yeah, you can think of it like that. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I mean, I don't, know, I don't remember if the paper actually goes into this. Yeah, they don't really mention relative paths. It's, I think it's just convenience. It's also that uh, every application starts in a working directory. Yeah, starts running. Yeah. The rel oh, sorry, the relative path is just this black. This is supposed to be black. Yeah, so I'm just trying to highlight what the working directory is. So let me let me take this out to make it less confusing. So if this is my working directory, then this refers to. So what about file.c here? This file.c. How would I refer to it as a relative path if I already have my working directory being? So it would be Paul. Home. Joe. Joe. My bad writing. File.c. And file.c. Questions about relative paths. You may question why you have a working directory. Let's leave that aside for a second. If you don't specify a forward slash at the beginning, the file system or the operating system will still be able to find what file you're talking about uniquely because it will just take the current running process's working directory, for instance, this path here that the shell is in, and it'll refer to the file from that working directory. Yeah. Yeah. That also includes like the dot and the double dot, right? Yes. Yeah, so good question. So dot and double dot. Let's Let's go into dot and double dot. Oops. Okay, qu questions, but before we move on, questions on this relative path and the current working directory? Yeah. You can think of it like that. So there's this command we'll see next week called PWD, which means print working directory. I think the operating system is maintaining a, the current working directory of the running application, running process. Sort of, yeah. You can think of it, think of it like that. But the operating system is maintaining it, yeah. That I don't know. I'm not sure. I guess an operating system could do that. It could use it for caching purposes. I think it's really probably designed around the shell. 
gives this interactivity so that you'd have, you know, in an interactive use of the operating system, it's useful to have a current path you're working in so you don't have to write whole paths all the time. So kind of like what you were saying before. I think that's probably more the, uh, probably more the inspiration for it. Okay, so let me get into these dot and dot dot directories. So as I, as I said uh, earlier, by convention, or just by, by the um, Unix standard, every directory has two special directories inside. And so I didn't write these initially because it makes things a little bit messier, but really inside of every, every one of these directories is contained, uh, let's see, yeah, I'll just, I'll put it on here. Inside of each one of these directories is contained two other special directories, a dot directory and a dot dot directory. So each one of these directories also contains a directory called dot and a directory called dot dot. So dot, dot dot, dot, dot dot. And actually, let me, this is getting, is this clear or is this too messy? Clear. Clear, clear enough? Okay. Okay. So it, it adds a lot of contents to the directory. And these are hidden by default when you list things in, in a Unix system. Uh, yeah, this is going to get messy really fast. Let me, let me make a new... Let me make a new uh, directory tree. Let's just replicate the home directory here. They're, yeah, they're mandated by the Unix design that every directory contains these two special entries. So they are always there, at least conceptually. Okay, so this is probably not super easy to look at. Um, but okay, so this dot directory let me at least use a different color for this. So this is our this is our working directory here. This dot directory points to itself. This parent directory points to the parent of. So Paul Paul's dot dot directory points to its parent. So what about this home directory here? It's dot directory points to which directory? Which directory does the dot directory point to under home? Home. So it points to itself. And this dot dot directory, which directory does it point to? Paul. It's parent directory. Okay. So that's, yeah, go ahead. Is the dot used to get out of the file? Out of the directory, you mean? Not quite. We'll see what dot is is used for um, in a second. Yeah. What about the, the dot dot in the home that's at the root? Where oh, so I, I left out the rest of this tree, but it would refer to this dot dot would refer to its parent, which is root, and root refers to always its parent refers to itself. <coughs> okay. So here's my working directory. My working directory is still this, this home directory. And here's a quick quiz. So let's say I have the path dot slash Paul slash 
file.c, which node on this tree am I referring to if I say dot slash Paul slash file dot C? What's that? The first home. The first home, this one? Yeah. This is my working directory. So, okay, so there's two file dot C's on this tree. Which one does this path refer to? This file dot C or this file dot C? <coughs> this one. So why is that? Because my working directory is home. And when I go to the dot directory, well, that's just referring back to the same home directory. So now I'm in the home directory, and I say, go to the Paul directory, I go here. And when I go to the file.c directory, I go here. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the file it refers to, nothing. It's the same file. Because we have these back edges on the tree, we could also say something like dot, slash dot, slash dot, slash dot, slash Paul, slash file. Which file does this refer to? The same one, file.c. So dot is like a cycle. It points to itself. So you can say dot, slash, dot, slash as many times as you like, and it's still the same directory. Yeah. Just dot uh, Paul. Uh, so dot is allowed in file names. So this would be referring to a file called dot Paul inside of the home directory, but that file doesn't exist. So I could have a file named, you know, dot Paul dot text, and that is a legal file name in Unix. Yeah. So like, what function does it serve being able to use the dot slash? So why why have dot slash? So there, uh, let's see. Put this, I put this in my notes somewhere. I thought I put this in my notes. So why, why would you want to have dot slash? Yeah. So yeah, you've probably encountered this running an executable. You've, you've tried to build like your Hello program. I build hello.c. I now have this program, or I now have this program called hello, and it doesn't run. So one reason that hello is used is to make clearly distinguish uh, hello, which is a program that's installed on your system, from one that's in your current directory. So by default, the Unix system won't run applications from your current directory. Instead, it looks at. I was. I think I was going to talk about this next week, but instead, it'll look at. Uh, a, a series of predefined directories where executables, executables are installed and look in those directories for an executable. So in order to explicitly tell your exec function that you want to you know, explicitly give a path, uh, you can use dot instead of writing out the whole working directory. You can use dot to refer. Think of dot as referring to current working directory. That's one way that you can use it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So if you run Python, yeah, you, yeah. If it's installed in one of these predefined or these system-defined directories, the bash shell will look for in in your paths. It'll look for uh, that direct that that program and execute it. So that's like one of the main reasons I can think of. It also just makes it explicit that you're saying uh, this is the directory that I'm that I'm referring to, rather than providing no directory. Okay, we have we have a little bit left. Uh, all right, so dot directory. It may seem a little superfluous, but the one place you do use it is when you write C programs. You want to execute it. You say dot slash because, and now now hopefully you know the reason for it. The reason is that uh, Unix will not just run programs assuming that they're in your current working directory. It's also kind of a good safety reason to do that, so you don't accidentally run a program that you didn't want to run. Um, but what dot slash does is it just explicitly refers to your current working directory. So that when you want to run a program, you just say, this is the directory I'm running it from. So you can think of programs, um, if they're not in your system paths, 
you have to give a full path, either relative or absolute, to that program in order to execute it. Questions on the dot path? So this is, again, just like the hierarchical file system. It's designed by people. You just have to remember it. Um, it has some other uses as well, but I, I, can't, I can't remember that right now. Uh, but it's anytime you want to explicitly refer to your current working directory. Yeah? No, the name of the dot is dot. So if, if you look at the, so um, I'll talk about this next time, but there, there are any files beginning with a dot are hidden by default. They won't be printed out by the, by the you know, convention. And so they're literally named dot in the, um, and you can even print out their, uh, their inode numbers. And they are the inode numbers of the, of the directory. Yeah. Can you quickly just show that tree again, like, with that example? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, yeah, so um, every directory contains a dot directory and a dot dot directory. So let's, let's look at Paul here. So Paul's, uh, I made this, this tree really complicated. So Paul's dot dot directory. It, so what is really going on under the hood is that the directory has an entry whose string name is dot dot and its inode number is the inode number of the parent. And to you know, make this more uh, sort of mechanical, and it also has a dot directory. The string name is literally dot. And that dot directory has the inode number of the very directory that is itself. It has its own inode number in its directory entry. So then, like, what if you're with that example, you're file.c? File.c? Yeah, like, how would you do that with So it depends on what your current working directory is. If your current working directory is here, home slash, then you would just say dot to refer to the current directory, which is home slash. Let me zoom out a little bit. Current working directory is home slash Paul, which is a directory within home, and file.c, which is in Paul. Does that make sense? Questions, questions on that? More questions on that? If your working directory is Paul, okay, good question. So if your working directory is Paul, then how would you refer to file.c? There's a number of ways, but what's one way? Yeah, you can say dot slash file.c. If your current working directory is Paul, then you can say dot slash, which refers to this directory, file.c. Yeah. So is that mean because running, uh, running applications runs it, doesn't run it in the working directory by default? So if you're in one directory, could you technically run a file from another directory if you like write out the path? Uh, I think by default, the shell will make whatever your current working directory of the shell is the current working directory of the running program. So you can run programs that are in other directories, but the working directory would be the one that your shell is currently in. Okay. So that answers. Like, it might have like errors. Then if you do that. Well, yeah. If you've ever had to like try to write scripts and you sort of forgot about the relative or the, the you just just assumed things about the paths, yeah, you can run into problems uh, very quickly. Uh, yeah. What is Say again. Z D. C D. Oh, change directory. We'll talk, about, we'll talk about that next week. We'll talk about it next week. Okay, so one, one more thing. I, I know you're eager to go. Uh, we, have, we do have three more minutes left. The class is till, till 20, I think, right? So 20. So, uh, okay, the dot dot. This, this, is, this is a much more useful one. Dot dot refers to the parent directory. So let's say this is my working directory again, home, and I want to refer to, uh, actually, yeah, and I want to refer to, say, this Paul here. If I say dot slash... Uh, Let's see, it's black. If I say dot slash home slash Paul, that's the same thing as saying, oh, no, that's not right. If I say dot slash Paul, that's the same thing as saying dot dot home slash Paul. So dot refers to home slash Paul. If I say dot dot, that refers to the parent, which is root. And then I say home and Paul. So dot dot just refers to whatever the parent directory is. So as we'll see next week when we do navigation, this makes it very convenient for you to work, move around your file system interactively and do file operations.
All right, so that's relative paths. We talked about the working directory. We talked about parents' directories. So just to wrap this up, the file abstraction is used for all sorts of things, not just storage. It's used for networks, pipes, RAM itself. You could actually touch RAM uh, through the file system, if you like, graphics cards, things like this. Um, all right, so you can look at the notes for the rest of this. And uh, oh yeah, your homework. Your homework. So your homework is to take this table of paths. I've given you absolute and relative paths here. And uh, just construct a tree that contains all of these files and directories in the right place on the tree. That kind of makes sense? Qu questions on that? Questions on that homework? Yeah. Uh, do you can do it on paper. You can do ASCII art. Either way. All right. Take care, everyone.